Fashion Archaeology is made possible by generous contributions from viewers like you. To learn how you can support me and my work, check out my Patreon page in the description box below. Thank you. Greetings and salutations. I'm Madison, and welcome to another episode of Fashion Archaeology. Previously, we learned about 1920s hair and makeup, and in today's episode, we will be looking at what clothing was worn by ladies in the 1920s. If you missed my previous episodes, please feel free to watch those and stay tuned for the third and final installment of my 1920s women's wear series. When most people think of 1920s fashion, they think of just one picture. Short skirts, Halloween costumes, tacky beaded dresses, elbow length gloves, and a feather headband or boa. In reality, the culture and fashion of the 20s was much more than the modern perception gives them credit. So, in this video, we will be chipping away the misinformation and revealing what women truly looked like from 1920 to 1929. First, let's take a look at what was going on culturally at the time. The Roaring Twenties were tucked in between two major world events, the end of World War I and the Great Depression. As a result of the war, women gained a more prominent role in society, developing a fresh sense of purpose as they took over jobs left by men who had gone to war. This, in part, led to the ratification of the 19th Amendment on November 2, 1920, granting women in the United States the right to vote. After the war, many women fought to stay in the workforce and began to participate more in the arts and sporting activities. The need to be, or at least appear to be, wealthy, vibrant, and socially active became extremely important for both the upper and middle classes. A whole new world of exciting pastimes such as driving in cars and flying had opened up to women. Even though there was a long way to go in regards to equal rights, African Americans also found more freedom of expression in this decade, especially in cities like Harlem. At the height of the movement known as the Harlem Renaissance, the area bustled with African American businesses, fashion trends, and artistic expression. In addition to new freedoms, the war also brought influences and imports from around the world to Europe and the United States. Asian, ancient Greek, and Egyptian imagery inspired both fashion and architecture. After archaeologists discovered the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun in 1922, it catapulted much of Western society into a bit of Egypt mania. The effects could be seen everywhere, from buildings to home decor, and yes, even fashion. The West, however, was not the only side of the world to change. The Roaring Twenties also brought Western styles to the East. This led to the creation of subcultures like Moga Girls, the Japanese equivalent of American flappers, and traditional dresses such as Chinese chipaos started to blend traditional prints and silks with Western styles and Art Deco prints. With the rise of moving pictures and film stars, celebrity culture spread throughout the world, and women looked to starlets to tell them what to wear. When magazines and department stores recognized the star power pull, advice articles and celebrity product sponsorships skyrocketed. 
mail-order catalogs and ready-to-wear garments were on the rise as well. The demand for affordable, modern fashion inspired department stores to manufacture clothing in bulk quantities, making it more accessible to women of various classes, sizes, and incomes. Through the emergence of the ready-to-wear market, clothing inspired by haute couture designers allowed women to follow trends at a cheaper price. Much to the chagrin of couture designers who felt their livelihood and craft threatened by the ever-closing gap between the working class and the exclusivity of their wealthy patrons. And speaking of wealth, while plenty of women still made their own clothing, shopping was becoming a popular pastime too. New grand department stores rose to the sky with palace-like grandeur. Inside there were cheery sales attendants, mannequins showcasing the latest styles, salons, and an elegant tea room for ladies to chat and relax in. Even if nothing was purchased, there was plenty to see if not to buy, and shopping became a social event that could easily take up an entire day. From 1920 to 1929, everyday apparel changed drastically, with a significant shift in silhouettes, ornamentation, and color palettes. The clothing styles of the early 20s still retained echoes from the previous decade. Despite the fact that many coats, dresses, and skirts were belted, the overall silhouette was still bulky, with excess fabric around the waistline and hips. The color palette of the early 20s focused heavily on blues, from dark navy to teal to steel blue. Dull browns, rosy pinks, forest greens, mustard yellows, and various tones of gray were all used as well. Instead of using prints, clothing was frequently left plain in color to allow more room for intricate sewing details and embellishments. From 1925 onward, a new look had become desirable. Women now adopted a more streamlined silhouette that hung loose from the shoulders, creating a straight, uninterrupted tube-like shape all the way down to the hemline. Speaking of hemlines, let's debunk another common myth. Hemlines from the 20s are commonly presented as being very short, but the truth is only showgirls wore short skirts. By our standard, the everyday woman's skirt was still quite long, rarely reaching the knee and certainly not miniskirt height. Waistlines fell at or below the hips, and much of the bulk and decoration of the early 20s gave way to cleaner lines. Stripes, diamonds, geometric prints, large plaids, and simple florals became more prominent. Colors also became more vibrant, with jewel tones and warm browns being used in the winter and a pastel palette for the spring and summer. Jade greens, burnt oranges, lavenders and dusty roses, peachy pinks and rich reds truly gave the era its distinct and colorful look. Black was also a new fashionable color. No longer confined to mourning or servants' uniforms, it could now be seen even in day wear. As each fashion season introduced new trends, a wide range of styles began to develop. Since we don't have a lot of time to focus on individual designers or high fashion, I did want to put together a quick montage just to give you a small idea of what designs were coming out of fashion houses at this time. These styles trickled down into everyday wear, and they introduced fresh ideas like surrealism and cubism into fashion. 
designers experimented with making casual wear more fashionable and incorporated designs and clothing making techniques that we can still see in our closets today. It is important to note, however, that not all women were the ideal shape, nor did they follow all the trends. Flappers are probably the most known style icons of the 1920s, but they were essentially the influencers of their day. Some were wild, spending a great deal of money on clothing, cars, and booze. Some fell deeply into debt, spending beyond their means to be popular. And some just had harmless fun enjoying the latest trends of the jazz scene. But, like influencers, flappers did not represent all young people, let alone all women. People came in all different shapes and sizes, and the everyday woman's wardrobe had to be more practical than that of flappers and movie stars. While this was an era of broken traditions and fresh new styles, women's lives still included tradition and dress etiquette. Yes, even flappers had their own set of rules and style codes. Certain colors were reserved for specific seasons and occasions. Similarly, dress styles would differ depending on the social gathering, time of day, or the occupation of the wearer. While this may seem complicated, it is pretty simple to understand once broken down. The fabrics, patterns, and amount of embellishment were the primary differences between house dresses, day dresses, afternoon dresses, and evening wear. House dresses were functional dresses worn by most women, except for the wealthy upper class who had servants to do work for them. Lightweight and comfortable, these were solely used for working and housekeeping. Often made at home, house dresses lacked any heavy decorations or trimming that would get in the way of working freely. They were, however, far from plain. Most were made of cotton in bright colors and prints like plaid, checks, gingham, and Swiss dot. Of course, no discussion about house dresses would be complete without mentioning aprons. Aprons were long and shapeless, with large pockets on the front to keep housekeeping or work necessities close at hand. Aprons also extended the life of house dresses by keeping them clean and in less need of washing or mending. Some jobs outside of the home required more than a house dress, and instead required the use of a uniform. Uniforms varied from company to company and job to job. Many of these uniforms reflected the current fashion trends, however they were much more conservative and had little to no fancy frills. A maid or waitress's outfit would be a prettier uniform like this, with an all-black dress and a small starched apron. Nurses usually wore a plain white or blue and white uniform, this time with a larger and longer apron. In factory work, you could get away with wearing a simple house dress or apron, but for especially dirty production tasks or assembly lines, Shop smocks or standardized uniforms were often necessary for safety and cleanliness. 
After household chores were complete, a woman might then change into a day dress, especially if she was going outside of the house. The day dress was the most common type of dress to be seen in public. It could be dressed up or down depending on the occasion and was the perfect option for occupations like office jobs and secretarial work. Early 20s dresses tended to have a higher neckline with a rounded V-neck or square shape. The long sleeves were often tight with simple matching cuffs, but sometimes a bell sleeve could be seen as well. Skirts were long and were designed to accentuate the hips through gathering, draping, or adding ruffles along the hip area. From the mid-twenties onward, fun prints emerged. Lacy ruffles or bows were seen at the neckline or at the waistline. Collars adopted small lapels inspired by men's shirt collars, and both cuffs and collars could be used to contrast the main body of the dress. Skirts were now much shorter and squarer in shape and pockets had been downsized to give a more sleek and tailored appearance. Wide dress sashes gave way to thin, narrow belts, or the waist was left completely loose. While hemlines rose, waistlines, which had been so high in the early 20s, fell lower and lower. For the summer months, a cool, simple white dress could be used for more casual activities ranging from picnics to camping or a visit to the beach to playing sports like tennis or lawn games like croquet. These comfortable short-sleeved dresses were often made of linen or cotton and were only worn for the most casual of activities. For more formal summer events, Tea dresses, also known as lawn dresses, were perfect for garden parties, outdoor teas, and more formal lawn games. They were either white or soft pastel in color, with lots of frills, layering of sheer fabric, and eyelet or lace detailing. Dresses for the fall and winter months often were made of thicker cottons, wools, and velvet. Prints shifted from florals to cozy plaids, and the use of lace was significantly toned down. Style-wise, not much changed in regards to the seasons, and hemlines and necklines were identical to those seen in the spring and summer months. Afternoon gowns were a step up in terms of luxury and quality. They were made using similar designs as day dresses, but with more luxurious and expensive materials. The significant differences between the day dress and the afternoon dress was that the afternoon dress had more ornamentation and it also lacked a collar. Collars were mostly reserved for more casual garments, so the majority of formal gowns had a simple boat neck rounded or square neckline without any collar at all. Most women did not have the fancy French-made beaded frocks we associate with flappers, and for most women the afternoon dress was the closest they could ever come to owning a glamorous gown. These dresses were mostly used for dinner parties and formal occasions such as graduations and weddings. And now we come to the most famous, yet one of the most misunderstood aspects of 1920s fashion, the evening gown. Evening, or cocktail gowns, embodied elegance and were both extravagant and expensive. Sleeves were rarely seen on evening wear, and both the neckline and backline plunged daringly low throughout the decade. Flowing fabrics such as chiffon, silk, satin, and taffeta were chosen for their softness and their ability to enhance subtle movements. 
They were frequently embellished with gold or silver embroidery, dangling crystal gems, beading, glistening sequins, as well as feathers, fur, or ruffles. In talking about embellishment, we find our next myth. Both costume and filmmakers alike seem to fixate on 1920s dresses having beaded fringe or tassels. However, when you actually look at photographs from that time, you don't see such an emphasis on fringe. Sure, beaded fringe was used, but it doesn't look the same as the way it's presented in movies. And there were so many other styles and ways of making dresses. You can see ruffles, you can see fabric layering, and other styles like the tulip-shaped skirt from the early 20s, or the gowns that flowed down to the floor reminiscent of ancient Greece. Not to mention the handkerchief hemline, which was particularly popular and ideal for flashing around on the dance floor. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I would like to see some fresh perspective when it comes to 1920s clothes, and I would like to see people tap into more accurate representations of 20s clothes, but also the variety. There was so much more going on than just the stereotype that is so often used and reused by fashion magazines, costume designers, and filmmakers. Even though dresses were a staple in most wardrobes, women had more options than just dresses. Separates, also known as tops and bottoms, had been popular long before the 1920s. However, with the rise of leisure for the middle class and more activities opening up, women required more casual outfit options. In most cases, separates could be used for pretty much any casual or semi-formal occasion. They were fairly common in the workforce, particularly in hidden jobs, such as stock rooms, telephone operators, and factories. And they were never worn for anything formal. Most blouses from the early 1920s had long or three-quarter length sleeves and a wide variety of embellishments. Like with dresses, sheer fabrics and soft silks were often utilized, especially in spring and summer, while flannel, velveteen, and taffeta were used more in the winter. Patterns were rare, with more emphasis again on embellishments such as lace or embroidery. Thick sashes tied in big bows were frequently seen on the bottom to create that chunky silhouette. And if a blouse was tucked in, it would be quite loose and billowy around the waist, as you can see here. By the mid to late 1920s, menswear dominated women's casual wear, and women's blouses transitioned from flowy and ornate to simple and sleek. Short sleeves were also starting to appear at this time. Large sashes could still be seen, however, the sash had moved lower, and if there was a bow, it would be now at the hip or in the front. New fads were popping up all the time, like the vest blouse, which had a pointed hemline on the bottom mimicking a man's vest. This, of course, was worn untucked and was frequently double-breasted to complete that menswear-inspired look. There was so much experimentation going on and various interpretations of wrap blouses, kimono blouses, smocks, and tunics were all seen. However, the most impacting and consistent trend to bridge both sides of the 20s was the nautical trend. Sailor-inspired blouses were popular well before the 1920s, but after World War I, nautical-inspired fashion skyrocketed in popularity. 
At the time, these were part of a style called midi blouses, which had a very square shape with little contour. All in all, these were not too dissimilar from what sailors actually wore, with maybe a little bit more detail and feminization going on. They could also come in various colors like white, navy, bright red, or even brown or khaki. Lastly, we have one of the most important blouses and one of the most commonly used. Though it may have altered and changed aesthetically over time, the biggest staple blouse of the era was the crisp cotton broadcloth blouse. From hard labor jobs which needed little decoration to more sporty versions which permitted something a little more flashy and festive, the cotton blouse was a quintessential garment in most wardrobes. Let's move on to one of my favorite aspects of 1920s fashion, knitwear. Knitwear in the 20s was always long and loose, but it featured many vibrant and fun designs, often mixing and clashing colors together. Again, here in knitwear, we will see the impact of men's clothing on women's clothing, specifically in regards to the Fair Isle design. In 1922, a draper from Learwick, Shetland, presented a hand-knit Fair Isle sweater to Prince Edward of Wales. Prince Edward, being a fashion icon of his time, caused an international sensation in both the United Kingdom and throughout North America by wearing these V-necked Fair Isle sweaters on the golf course. As the decade proceeded on, novelty print sweaters and vests grew more unique and distinctive, drawing influences not just from the Emerald Isles, but from other cultures as well. Greek, Egyptian, Native American, and Asian motifs were all used in addition to Art Deco and Cubist designs, plaids, diamonds, checks, and polka dots. Knitwear actually has a long and historic connection to sports, and knit clothing was primarily associated with underwear or activewear. The term sport was frequently used in ads pertaining to either knit clothing or casual clothing. While knitwear was still very much connected to casual wear, the 1920s saw the first high fashion use of knit pieces. Designers started to accept the idea that knitwear was not limited just to sports, and it could be just as stylish and an expression of fashion as any other material. While still not appropriate for formal occasions, stylish knitwear started to take shape as designers experimented with skirt and blouse sets as well as knit dresses. This new interest in knitwear also opened up more style options for women. Cardigans were known as many things from sweater jackets, knit coats, shaker knit coats, or simply shakers. Shakers were thick and cozy, with large front pockets and a shawl collar, ideal for long hours in the very cold weather. Thinner cardigans were also used more for spring and summer, and were often seen on the tennis court or at golf courses. The tuxedo sweater was another unique popular sweater style, especially in the early 1920s. It was fairly thin and had a loose belt or tie at the waist. That way you could wear the sweater openly to display the blouse worn underneath. Lastly, in the knitwear section, we have overblouses and sweater vests. Sweater vests were more laid back and popular for athletic adventures, while overblouses could be casual, but they could also be dressed up or come with a matching skirt to make a knit set. These were readily accessible in a wide range of colors, designs, and collar styles, as were sweater vests. 
The overblouse could be worn throughout the entire year with long sleeve options for the winter and short sleeve options for the spring and summer. Skirt fashions largely followed the shifting dress styles. Throughout the decade, hemlines fluctuated between the ankle and mid-calf before shooting up to just below the knee. However, the hemline, along with the stock market, fell back down to the lower calf by 1929. This lowering hemline signaled the fact that a more conservative and covered look was to come in the 1930s. Decorative ruffles, buttons, and flaps were prominent throughout the first part of the decade. The waistbands were again enormous, and pockets were large and prominent. As time went on, the shape moved away from the tight, curvy hobble-style skirt to a sleeker, squarer shape, featuring plain or patterned fabrics rather than embellishments. Pleats were one of the most frequently seen skirt details throughout the decade, with an extensive range of styles and widths. Like with other garment design choices of the 1920s, clothing designers used pleats to call attention to and exaggerate a lady's movement. Moving on to trousers. The concept of women wearing trousers had flickered up through different cultures and time periods, but it had never really fully taken hold in the West. Even though women had worn trousers decades before, it was still a shocking or novel concept to many people in the 1920s. Dismissed by some as just a passing fad or a sign of degrading society, some people took a stronger stance by going to court in an effort to ban trouser wearing or going as far as jailing women for wearing trousers. There were plenty of people, however, that had a more optimistic view of the situation. Not everyone viewed trouser wearing with such a violent reaction or with such disgust. Some understood that comfortable and sensible attire is required for completing work and is not only a basic human right, but it is a basic human need if you are going to complete everyday human tasks. The most copied men's trouser styles were knickerbockers and riding breeches. Knickerbockers were baggy and wide, ballooning out at the thigh and tapering into a buttoned cuff at the knee. Riding breeches were similar but thinner and slimmer in shape. Fabrics like corduroy, linen, tweed, or denim were ideal for roughhousing and outdoor activities, so these were commonly used for trousers and overalls. At the turn of the 20th century, tailored suits for women consisted of a matching or coordinated jacket and skirt combination, which were used for office work, travel, and leisure. Some were plain and resembled men's suits, while others had bright designs and a contrasting trim, pinstripe, or embroidery. Suits from the early 1920s featured a distinct silhouette, with a long ankle-length skirt and a jacket extending down to the mid-thigh. Usually there was also a belt over the jacket, emphasizing that pear-shaped silhouette. Hips would be even more emphasized by large pockets, pleats, stripes, and buttons. The neckline was usually either a v-neck with lapels or a high sort of turtleneck collar. Much of the trimmings had been pared down by 1924, yet while skirts became shorter, jackets remained slender and long. Some jackets were so long that they hit at the knee, ending right at the hemline of the skirt, becoming much more like a matching coat 
but still retaining the thinness of a suit jacket. The biggest change for suits, however, was the neckline. Gone were the bulky high collars of the early 1920s and late 1910s. In came shawl necklines and tuxedo lapels. By the late 1920s, contrasting lapels appeared, and prints were even popular, usually coordinated with a contrasting skirt. Once again, we see Coco Chanel's strong influence in fashion, this time on the tailored suit. The Chanel tweed suit, first released in 1923, was designed to find the perfect balance between style and efficiency. It consisted of a jacket and a skirt made of light wool or mohair tweed, and a blouse in jersey or silk. Each client would have repeated adjustments made until their suit was just right for them to perform daily activities with ease. Chanel often tested these suits by having models walk around and replicate the movements of climbing stairs or bending low to get into a car. The idea was to make sure women could comfortably do all that they need to do without being exposed or be inhibited by their clothing. Working class women, however, did not have such luxury and had to make do with mail order or handmade suits with a simpler design and construction. And now we come to our final subject of today's episode, coats and outerwear. Early 20s coats had big collars that closed up around the neck, similar to the suits that we just saw. They had big cuffs on the arms, large buttons, huge pockets, and matching belts. Soon, wrap coats started to prevail in style. And now, collars were raised up in the back and splayed open in the front to open up the neckline and enhance that long V-shape. Many materials were used for outerwear. Wool, tweed, rubber, velvet, leather. But one of the most important materials was fur. Fur, faux or real, cheap or expensive was the key feature to most coats and capes. If a woman could not have a fur coat, she would probably at least have a fur detachable collar or some sort of fur stole. Those who did not have that luxury might use a large shawl or fluffy woolen collar to simulate that full shape at the neckline. The most expensive furs came from sable, mink, beaver, civet, fox, and even some more exotic creatures like monkeys or wolves. Some less expensive options included squirrel, rabbit, possum, and raccoon. Of course, all of these price points changed depending on the quality and the rareness of the animal. Some raccoon coats could be quite expensive, while a cheaply made or poorly made mink might actually be less expensive than the raccoon. College girls in particular loved the raccoon coat. Raccoon coats were medium priced and were usually purchased for a girl by her parents or boyfriend. Although oversized, cumbersome and prone to shedding, this coat was a symbol of youth, excess, and affluence. Truly a must-have piece for any chic college girl wanting to be popular on campus. For fancy events, capes and evening coats, also known as opera coats, were masterpieces of design and beauty. Like with evening gowns, inspiration for these pieces came from around the world, and no amount of lavishness was too much. 
more expensive capes and coats would be heavily decorated with metallic embroidery, braids, tassels, amazing brocades, beading, exotic motifs, and sometimes even painted pictures. Feathers were also commonly used for formal events, especially on warmer days when fur was just a little too hot. But of course, fur coats were not practical for every occasion, and not every woman could afford to have such lavish attire. So, with so much time spent out of the house, either working or hiking or motoring about the country, a good sport coat was essential. Even though driving was not an easy task, the freedom to drive a car greatly changed women's fashion, especially in the area of coats. The cumbersome outfits of the early motoring period gave way to sleeker clothing, and tailored motoring coats replaced the shapeless smock-like dusters of the 1910s. Aviation also made its mark in women's closets, bringing leather jackets into popularity for gallivanting outdoors on adventures both in the air and on the ground. However, there is still one more type of coat that was very important, the raincoat. Plastic rain gear had not yet been invented, so for rainy days, the rain slicker or rain cape kept a lady safe and dry from the elements. Made from stiff rubber or heavy oilcloth, rain attire was not the most stylish or comfortable but it did the job. I hope that you enjoyed this video and please stay tuned for part three where we will finish our look into 1920s women's wear. If you would like to support me and my work, please feel free to also check out my Patreon page. Patreon is a platform where you can give me monthly support for my work, and in return, you will have a more personal relationship with me as a content creator, as well as access to exclusive content, early access to my videos, and more. If that interests you, check out the link to my Patreon page in the description box below and at the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching.